Hello. In this module on pharmaceuticals, we understand that it is a discipline of pharmacy that deals with the process of turning a new chemical entity into a medication that can be used safely and effectively by patients. It is also called as the science of dosage form design. A pharmaceutical industry discovers, develops, produces and markets drugs or pharmaceutical drugs for the usage of medications which are to be administered to patients. This is done with an aim to cure them, vaccinate them or alleviate their symptoms. A pharmaceutical drug or medicine is any chemical substance that is used in the medical diagnosis, treatment or prevention of disease. There are many chemicals with pharmacological properties but need special measures to help them achieve their therapeutically relevant amounts at their site of action. Pharmaceutics helps relate the formulation of drugs to their delivery and disposition in the body. Pharmaceutical formulations in pharmaceutics is the process in which different chemical substances including the active drug, are combined to produce a final medicinal product. The word formulation is often used in a way that includes dosage form. Formulation studies involve developing a preparation of the drug which is both stable and acceptable to the patient. For orally administered drugs, usually the drug is made in a tablet or a capsule. Pre-formulation involves the characterization of the drug's physical, chemical and mechanical properties in order, in order to choose what other ingredients or excipients should be used in their preparation. The drug form varies by the route of administration like capsules, tablets and pills, etc. Now let us take a look at the various ways in which drugs can be administered. At first, we have the oral route, then injections, rectal and topical. So let us dive into each of them and understand how these different drug administration methods work. In the first, the enteral or oral drugs, which are normally taken as tablets or capsules. The drug itself needs to be soluble in an aqueous solution at a controlled rate. Such factors as particle size or crystallity form significantly important aspects to look into the dissolution of the drug. A tablet is usually compressed preparation which contains about 5 to 10 percent of the main active drug ingredient. In the remainder, 80 percent composes of the excipients like fillers, disintegrants, lubricants and binders. 10% of these compounds also involve the disintegration and dissolution of the tablet in the stomach or the intestines. Such chemicals must be used along with the drug for their use. The dissolution time can be modified for a rapid effect of a sustained release. A capsule is a gelatinous envelope enclosing the active substance. Capsules can be designed to remain intact for some hours after ingestion in order to delay absorption. There are a number of methods which in which tablets or capsules can be modified in order to allow for sustained release of the active compound as it moves through the digestive tract. Next is parenteral formulations which is also called as the injectable formulations and these can be done intravenously, subcutaneously or intramuscularly. The drug is stored in a liquid or if it is unstable, then lyophilized form will be said, kept. Many of these formulations are unstable at higher temperatures and require to be stored at a refrigeratory temperature or sometimes even frozen conditions. Most protein formulations are fragile due to their nature of the molecule, which is why it can be destroyed in an enteric administration. So let us look at the different methods in which injections work. The first is the intravenous therapy, abbreviated for IV. 
the therapy delivers fluids directly into the veins the intravenous route of administration can be used as an injection where a syringe is used at high pressures or as an infusion where typically we have used the pressure supplied by gravity intravenous infusions are commonly referred to as drips the intravenous route is the fastest way to deliver medications and fluid replacement throughout the body because they are introduced directly into the blood intravenous therapy may be used for fluid volume replacement in order to correct electrolytic imbalances in the body to deliver medication of a blood transfusion the second method is intramuscularly also abbreviated for im in the in this the injection of a substance is directly injected into the muscle muscles are found to have larger and more numerous blood vessels than subcutaneous tissue intramuscular injections have found to have faster rates of absorption than the other methods sites that are bruised tender red swollen inflamed or scarred must be avoided some of the possible sites for such injections would include the deltoid which is the arm dorso gluteal which is the buttocks and the rectus femoris which is the thigh muscles a subcutaneous injection is administered as a bolus into the subcutis the layer of skin directly below the epidermis and the dermis is collectively referred to as the cutis this is used in cases where a very small amount of the medicine has to be given subcutaneous injections are highly effective in administering medications such as insulin morphine and diacetyl morphine rectal administrations use the rectum as a route of administration of the medication and other fluids these fluids are directly absorbed by the rectum's blood vessels and they flow into the blood's circulatory system which distributes the drug to the body organs and other bodily systems the drug that is administered rectally will in general have a faster onset higher bioavailability and shorter duration of oral ad compared to oral administration another advantage of administering a drug rectally is that it tends to produce less nausea compared to the oral route a topical medication is a medication that is applied to a particular place on or in the body most often topical administration means application to the body surfaces such as the skin or mucous membranes to treat ailments via a large range of classes including creams foams gels lotions and ointments now let us have a look at a video to understand this Enteral medications are broken down within the GI tract and absorbed into the bloodstream where they are carried directly to the liver allowing the liver to act on the medication before it is distributed this is called the first pass effect the degree varies but any drug not given by some form of injection will always have a bioavailability of less than 100% Some substances such as insulin are broken down in the GI tract into a non-therapeutic substance and therefore cannot be given enterally. During first pass, the liver chemically processes the drug into active and inactive metabolites. The active metabolites of some drugs cause prolonged duration of activity. For instance, the effects of diazepam can last for weeks or months. The ratio of active and inactive metabolites affect the bioavailability of the drug. This is the primary reason that enteral medications of the same dose have less effect than if given parenterally. For example, morphine given as tablets requires a significantly higher dose for effective analgesia than morphine given intravenously or by intramuscular injections. The first pass effect may be low 
moderate, or high, depending on the drug. Absorption of enteral medications is also affected by factors in the GI tract itself. Enteric-coated medications may remain in the stomach long enough for the coating to dissolve if taken with a large volume of food. Acid-sensitive drugs taken on an empty stomach may be rendered ineffective. Gastric acids affect absorption, and little is known regarding the effects of either the short-term acid reducers such as ranitidine, Zantac, and famotidine, Pepsid, or the longer-acting proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole, Prilosec. The rate of intestinal motility varies significantly from individual to individual and is affected by activity, age, diet, overall health, and medications that slow or stimulate intestinal function. Biorhythms affect both intestinal motility and gastric acid levels, so the time of day when the medication is administered can have direct effects on drug absorption and drug tolerance. People who receive chemotherapeutic drugs in the morning often report less GI side effects than if they receive them in the afternoon. Another factor that affects medication absorption is age. The aging process slows intestinal motility and can also decrease absorption. This may be further complicated by the fact that aging can increase or decrease sensitivity to various chemical substances. And the chemical attributes of the medication itself affect the rate of absorption. These include acid sensitivity and interactions with foods that may increase, decrease, or alter their effects. The chemical components of medications can be affected by the presence of other medications. The more medications an individual is receiving, the greater the likelihood of an adverse interaction such as a chemical change in the drug or drugs that increases or decreases the rate of absorption. Alterations to the bowel, such as bariatric surgery and bowel resection, decrease the intestinal surface area, directly decreasing the rate of absorption. Finally, vigorous activity decreases absorption by shunting blood away from the GI tract to support the heart and muscles. Regular participation in sports or training activities may require adjustment in the time of administration of medications. Now we'll focus on drugs given by parenteral roots. These medications don't experience the first pass effect and are 100% available as they enter the bloodstream. Receptors are proteins usually cell surface receptors which bind to ligands and cause responses in the immune system. A molecule that binds to a receptor is called as a ligand and it can be a peptide or any other small molecule such as a neurotransmitter, hormone, pharmaceutical drug, toxin or parts of the outside of a virus or a microbe. When a ligand binds to its corresponding receptor, it activates or inhibits the receptor's associated biochemical pathway. Receptors can induce cell growth, division, and death, control the membrane channels, or regulate cell binding. Receptors play an important role in signal transduction, immunotherapy, and immune responses. One of the important areas where receptors chiefly perform their activity is between neurons. Neurons are the body's electrical network system that pass on signals from the world that surrounds us to our brain and vice versa. These systems are controlled by a cascade of chemicals that work in between each neuron in a tiny, tiny empty house called the synapse. Many receptors present at the junction between neurons play a vital role in passing these signals. Chemical messengers or neurotransmitters function as postmen between the neurons carrying the signal to the receptor, where the receptor may or may not undergo a modification to bring about a chemical response to pass on the signal. Neurotransmitters are endogenous chemicals acting as signaling molecules that enable neurotransmission. 
They are a type of chemical messenger which transmits signals across a chemical synapse from one neuron to another target neuron. Sometimes maybe even to a muscle cell or to a gland cell. In immunology, an antigen is a molecule or rather a molecular structure which may be present on the outside of a pathogen that can be bound by an antigen specific antibody or a B cell antigen receptor. The presence of antigens in the body normally trigger an immune response. An antibody, also known as immunoglobin, is a large Y-shaped protein molecule produced mainly by the plasma cells that is used by the immune system to neutralize pathogens and various kinds of pathogenic bacteria and viruses. Thus, an antibody is a part of your immune system that is produced in the presence of an antigen or a foreign body. Paul Enrich coined the term antibody in his side chain theory at the end of the 19th century. In 1899, Ladlis Duchens named the hypothetical substance halfway between a bacterial constituent and an antibody as substances, immunogens or antigens, meaning antigenic or immunogenic substances. He originally believed that those substances are to be precursors of antibodies, just as zymogen is a precursor of an enzyme. But in 1903, he understood that an antigen induces the production of immune bodies, or rather antibodies, and wrote down that word as antigen. Now let us take a look at a video to understand how our body's own immune system works. An allergy is an overreaction of the immune system to a normally harmless substance called an allergen. Common allergens include pollen, animal dander, down feathers, mites, chemicals, and a variety of foods. On first exposure, the inhaled allergen enters the mucous membrane lining the nasal passages, where it is taken up by the antigen-presenting cell, which presents it to the T-cells. These T-cells activate the B-cells to release substances called IgE antibodies against the allergen. These IgE antibodies sit on the surface of the mast cells. The mast cells have granules containing chemical mediators like histamine and prostaglandins, etc. On exposure, the allergen binds to the IgE antibodies present on the mast cells, cross-linking them. This results in the release of histamine, prostaglandins, and other mediators into the surrounding tissue. These mediators cause dilation of the surrounding blood vessels and increase their permeability. This results in the nasal stuffiness, sneezing, and mucus discharge of allergic rhinitis. Antihistamines work by blocking the action of histamines at its receptors and thus decreasing the body's reaction to the allergen. People typically use the word antihistamine to describe drugs for treating allergies while doctors and scientists use the term to describe a drug that opposes the activity of histamine receptors in the body. Typically, people take antihistamines as an in inexpensive, generic, over-the-counter drug that can provide relief from nasal congestion, sneezing, or hives caused by pollen, dust mites, or animal allergies with a few side effects. Antihistamines are usually for short-term treatment. Chronic allergies increase the risk of health problems which antihistamines might not be able to treat. Some of these would include asthma, sinuses, and the lower respiratory tract infection. Consultation of a medical professional is recommended for those who intend to take antihistamines for a long-term use. Synthetic drugs like Bromphenermine and terfenadine act as antihistamines. They interfere with the natural action of histamine by competing with the histamine for its binding site receptors where histamine exerts its effect. 
not much is published in research which compares the efficacy and safety of the various antihistamines available however the research which does exist is mostly about the short term studies or the studies which have been looked upon a very few number of people and have made some general assumptions the united states government removed two second generation antihistamines terfenidine and astimizol from the market on the basis of an evidence that they cause heart problems an antipyretic is a substance that can reduce fever or rather lower the body temperature a thermostat is found in the lower part of your brain called the hypothalamus the hypothalamus knows what temperature your body should be usually kept around 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 degrees fahrenheit the hypothalamus will send a message to your body to keep it that way antipyretics cause the hypothalamus to override a prostaglandin induced increase in temperature the body then works to lower the temperature which results in the reduction in fever most antipyretic medications have other purposes the most common antipyretics used in the united states and in many other parts of the world would be ibuprofen and aspirin which are non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs used primarily as analgesics but also are found to have some antipyretic properties paracetamol also known as acetaminophen in the us is an analgesic with a mild anti inflammatory properties they tend to be effective not only when actual fever is present but they also have ensured that they do not lower the body temperature if it is also in its normal range this is helpful because antipyretics have other functions such as providing pain relief or decreasing an inflammation children and people with certain stomach conditions shouldn't use an antipyretic like aspirin ibuprofen is also found to irritate the stomach lining and paracetamol isn't a good choice for alcoholics or patients with liver dysfunction when the brain receives a signal that it has a perception of pain that being felt the pain the trauma the stress that your body undergoes it is a signal sent to your brain by a set of key receptors present near the epidermis of your skin so if you put your hand on a hot stove your nerve cells call upon your brain and your brain quickly sends a message that is indicating your hurt hand with this message you pull your hand away from the hot stove which saves you from any kind of further injury pain is an important area of our biological system it only helps us prevent ourselves from further damage an analgesic or a painkiller is any member of the group of drugs used to achieve analgesia that is relief from pain analgesic drugs act in various ways on the peripheral and central nervous system they are a distinct form of anesthetics which temporarily affect and in sometimes completely eliminate a sensation of pain these are classified into two types the narcotic and the non narcotic or the non addictive analgesics Nociceptors are the types of receptors that exist for you to feel pain and any pain that is likely to be caused by the body being harmed. Harm can include a mechanical or a physical damage to various parts of the body. For example, the damaged areas could be your skin, muscle, bones or any other tissue. The nociceptors can also detect a chemical and thermal damage. Chemical damage is caused by contact with toxic and hazardous chemicals exposure to extremely hot or cold temperatures leads to thermal damage when acted activated by a stimuli nociceptors would notify the brain about the injury with electrical signals sent via the peripheral nervous system to the brain's central nervous system prostaglandins act as signals to control several different processes depending on the part of the body which has been affected prostaglandins are produced at the site of the tissue where the damage or an infection may have occurred 
and it will cause an inflammation, pain or even fever, all as a part of the healing process. These nociceptors are very sensitive to the presence of prostaglandins and in turn will inform your brain everything about the pain. Like, where is it? How much it hurts? How fast can you retrieve yourself back? The brain will then make its judgment and respond. Analgesics include paracetamol. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as salicylates or opioid drugs like morphine and oxycodone. These pain relievers work with your cells, your body's nerve ending tissues, the nociceptors, your entire nervous system and your brain just to keep you from feeling pain. Just as a fact, although our nerve skin endings can sense pain and send signals to our brain, our brain itself cannot feel pain. It's like we say, even though your head pains, it's not your brain that's paining, it's just the signals firing. So now, let's look at a video to understand the concept of pain slightly better. Say you're at the beach and you get sand in your eyes. How do you know the sand is there? You obviously can't see it, but if you're a normal, healthy human, you can feel it that sensation of extreme discomfort, also known as pain. Now, pain makes you do something. In this case, rinse your eyes until the sand is gone. And how do you know the sand is gone? Exactly, because there's no more pain. There are people who don't feel pain. Now, that might sound cool, but it's not. If you can't feel pain, you could get hurt, or even hurt yourself, and never know it. Pain is your body's early warning system. It protects you from the world around you and from yourself. As we grow, we install pain detectors in most areas of our body. These detectors are specialized nerve cells called nociceptors that stretch from your spinal cord to your skin, your muscles, your joints, your teeth, and some of your internal organs. Just like all nerve cells, they conduct electrical signals, sending information from wherever they're located back to your brain. But unlike other nerve cells, nociceptors only fire if something happens that could cause or is causing damage. So. Gently touch the tip of a needle. You'll feel the metal, and those are your regular nerve cells, but you won't feel any pain. Now, the harder you push against the needle, the closer you get to the nociceptor threshold. Push hard enough, and you'll cross that threshold and the nociceptors fire, telling your body to stop doing whatever you're doing. But the pain threshold isn't set in stone. Certain chemicals can tune nociceptors, lowering their threshold for pain. Now, when cells are damaged, they and other nearby cells start producing these tuning chemicals like crazy, lowering the nociceptor's threshold to the point where just touch can cause pain. And this is where over-the-counter painkillers come in. Aspirin and ibuprofen block production of one class of these tuning chemicals, called prostaglandins. Let's take a look at how they do that. When cells are damaged, they release a chemical called arachidonic acid. Now, two enzymes, called COX-1 and COX-2, convert this arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2, which is then converted into a bunch of other chemicals that do a bunch of things, including raise your body temperature, cause inflammation, and lower the pain threshold. Now, all enzymes have an active site. That's the place in the enzyme where the reaction happens. The active sites of COX-1 and COX-2 fit arachidonic acid very cozily. As you can see, there's no room to spare. Now, it's in this active site that aspirin and ibuprofen do their work. So they work differently. Aspirin acts like a spine from a porcupine. It enters the active site and then breaks off, leaving half of itself in there, totally blocking that channel and making it impossible for the arachidonic acid to fit. This permanently deactivates COX-1 and COX-2. Ibuprofen, on the other hand, enters the active site but doesn't break apart or change the enzyme. COX-1 and COX-2 are free to spit it out again, but for the time that that ibuprofen is in there, the enzyme can't bind arachidonic acid and can't do its normal chemistry. But how do aspirin and ibuprofen know where the pain is? Well, they don't. Once the drugs are in your bloodstream, they are carried throughout your body, and they go to painful areas just the same as normal ones. So that's how aspirin and ibuprofen work. But there are other dimensions to pain. Neuropathic pain, for example, is pain caused by damage to our nervous system itself, there doesn't need to be any sort of outside stimulus. And scientists are discovering that the brain controls how we respond to pain signals. For example, how much pain you feel can depend on whether you're paying attention to the pain or even your mood. 
So pain is an area of active research. If we can understand it better, maybe we can help people manage it better. As we classified analgesics into narcotic and non-narcotic analgesics, let's take a little deeper understanding towards each of them. So first, the non-narcotic or the non-addictive analgesics. Non-narcotic analgesics are medications that are used to control pain and inflammation. They are available at a drugstore without prescription or by prescription when given at a higher dose. Aspirin and paracetamol belong to the class of non-narcotic analgesics. Aspirin is the most familiar one. Aspirin inhibits the synthesis of chemicals known as prostaglandins which stimulate inflammation in the tissue and cause pain. Non-opioids like these are used to treat acute or persistent pain that is mild to moderate. They are also found to be in combination with other medications or therapies to treat moderate to severe pains. On the other hand, opioids or the narcotic analgesics are medications that mimic the activity of endorphins. These are substances produced by the body to control pain. They are available only by prescription. Opioids are used to treat acute pain related to surgery and other medical procedures, as well as for persistent or rather chronic and breakthrough pain that is moderate to severe. Persistent pain is usually treated with long-acting opioids that are released into the body slowly and control pain for longer periods of time. Opioids are sometimes taken in combination with non-opioids. Morphine and many of its homologues, when administered in medical doses, relieve pain and produce sleep. So now let us have a look at a video and take a deeper understanding into the next concept called as diabetes. But before we move into the video of diabetes, let's have a look at what does it actually mean? What are the simple principles of diabetes? For your reference, in the reference section at the end of this video, we have kept the links available for you to read up a little bit of more work in diabetes. A simpler understanding to diabetes. Once we have understood what diabetes are after having read through the material, we come to understand that diabetes is a chronic disease that occurs either when the pancreas does not produce enough insulin or when the body cannot effectively use the insulin it produces. But what is insulin? Insulin is a hormone that regulates the blood sugar. It is a condition where the body produces a sweet urine. Without insulin, glucose stays in the blood and blood sugar levels get too high. High blood sugar produces symptoms of frequent urination, increased thirst and increased hunger. Over time, diabetes can damage the heart, blood vessels, eyes, kidneys and nerves. Adults with diabetes have two or three-fold increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. Diabetes is among the leading causes of kidney failure. A simple lifestyle measure can, has been shown to be effective in preventing and delaying the onset of particularly type 2 diabetes, which we shall speak in this video. By maintaining a healthy body weight, doing at least 30 minutes of regular moderate intensity workouts on most of the days, eating a healthy diet, avoiding sugar and saturated fats can help one prevent diabetes. So as we said, there are types of diabetes. The first one is type 1 diabetes and the other is type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, previously known as insulin-dependent, juvenile or childhood onset type diabetes, is characterized by deficient insulin production and requires daily administration of insulin. Neither the cause of type 1 diabetes nor the means to prevent it are known to be found even today. It has just been understood that they are genetically inherited. Symptoms include excessive excretion of urine, polyuria, excessive thirst, polydipsia, constant hunger, weight loss, vision changes, fatigue and extreme tiredness, 
are some of the symptoms which may suddenly occur. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, is was formerly known as non-insulin dependent or adult onset diabetes, which is a result from the body's ineffective use of insulin. The majority of the body with diabetes of type 2 is found to be in the population. This type of diabetes is largely the result of an excess body weight and physical inactivity. Symptoms may be similar to those of type 1 diabetes, but are often less marked. As a result, the disease may be diagnosed several years after the onset, after many complications may have already arisen. Until recently, this type of diabetes was seen only in adults, but it is now also occurring increasingly frequent in children. So with this, I now present to you the video to summarize diabetes on a little more animated related scale. In this film, we're going to explain how your body processes the food you eat in order to provide all your body cells with the energy they need and also what happens when you have diabetes and this system doesn't work properly. When you eat food that contains carbohydrate, it's broken down in the stomach and digestive system into glucose, which is a type of sugar. We need glucose from food because that's what gives us energy. Carbohydrate containing foods are things like starchy foods, sugary foods, milk and some dairy products and fruit. This glucose then moves into the bloodstream and the body detects that the blood glucose level is rising. In response to that, the pancreas, which is a little gland that sits just underneath the stomach, starts to release a hormone called insulin. And it's insulin that helps our body get the energy from the food we eat. The bloodstream then takes the glucose and the insulin to every cell in our body that needs it. To make this easier to understand, let's look at muscle cells. At the muscle cells, it's insulin that allows the glucose to get into the cells where it can be used for energy. It's a bit like insulin is a key unlocking the door to the cells so the glucose can get in. That way, the blood glucose level starts to drop. But the blood glucose level can be topped up at any point by the liver releasing extra glucose that it has stored the blood glucose rises again, and again, the pancreas produces more insulin to move with that glucose through the bloodstream to the muscle cells, open the doors and let the glucose in. The body functions best with the blood glucose at an optimum level. It doesn't like it if the blood glucose rises too high. Normally, there's a cycle within the body which balances out the glucose and the insulin level. And this is achieved by the food you eat, the pancreas and the liver. However, in some people, the system doesn't work properly and they develop diabetes. There are two main types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. In type 1 diabetes, the body isn't making any insulin at all. This is because of an autoimmune response whereby the body has destroyed the insulin producing cells in the pancreas. We don't entirely know why that happens in some people and not in others. Type 1 diabetes accounts for about 10% of all cases. It's most often found in the under 40s and it's by far the most common type of diabetes found in childhood. In type 1 diabetes, the carbohydrate containing food is broken down into glucose as normal. That glucose then moves into the bloodstream. Normally, the body would produce insulin to let that glucose into the cells. But in type 1 diabetes, there is no insulin being produced. So the glucose can't get into the body cells at all. So the level of glucose in the blood rises and rises. The body tries to lower the level of glucose, it tries to get rid of the glucose through the kidneys. That's why people who have undiagnosed type 1 diabetes tend to go to the toilet a lot to pass urine. As the kidneys filter the glucose out of the blood, they also take a lot of water with it. So the person with diabetes will get very thirsty. 
So urine contains a lot of glucose and that creates an environment where it's quite easy for bacteria to thrive. So it's also quite common to get thrush or genital itching. In the same way, the blood contains a high level of glucose as well. So more bacteria than usual will tend to breed in flesh wounds and they might be slow to heal. Glucose can also build up in the lens at the front of the eye, causing the liquid in the lens to become cloudy. That can mean that some people with undiagnosed type 1 diabetes can have blurred vision. Because the glucose can't get into the cells to be used for energy, somebody who's got undiagnosed type 1 diabetes is going to start feeling very tired, lethargic and unable to sort of go about their normal daily routine. But the body still needs an energy source in order to work properly. So what it does is it starts to break down its fat stores and that can lead to weight loss. So the main symptoms of type 1 diabetes are going to the toilet a lot, thirst, thrush or genital itching, slow healing of wounds, blurred vision, tiredness and weight loss. These symptoms generally happen quite quickly, often over a few weeks, and can be reversed once the diabetes is treated with insulin. Type 2 diabetes accounts for about 90% of all cases in the population. It's most common in the over 40 age group in the white population, and in the over 25 age group in the South Asian population. Type 2 diabetes is a little more complex because there's slightly more processes at work. Either the body isn't producing quite enough insulin, or the insulin it is producing isn't working properly. That can be due to being overweight because a buildup of fat can stop insulin doing its job properly. But it can also happen in people of a healthy weight. So in type 2 diabetes, the carbohydrate containing food is broken down into glucose in the stomach and digestive system as normal. That glucose then moves into the bloodstream. The pancreas starts to produce insulin, which moves with the glucose through the bloodstream to all the body cells which need glucose for energy. However, the glucose can't always get into the cells because the locks to the cell doors have become furred up with fat deposits. That means that the insulin can't open the cell doors properly. So the level of glucose in the blood continues to rise. In response to this, the pancreas produces even more insulin. So the blood glucose levels continue to rise and the insulin levels continue to rise. This situation is further complicated by the cells, which are desperate for energy, sending out emergency signals to the liver to release stored glucose. The blood glucose level goes up and up, and the pancreas produces more and more insulin until it can't cope anymore, and eventually it can wear out. As with type 1 diabetes, the symptoms of type 2 diabetes are going to the toilet a lot, thirst, thrush or genital itching, slow healing of wounds, blurred vision, tiredness and weight loss in some people. The symptoms for type 2 diabetes come along very slowly and some people don't have any symptoms at all. So for that reason, people can live with type 2 diabetes for up to 10 years before they realise that they have it. Type 2 diabetes can be treated in a number of different ways. Initially, it may be sufficient to make changes to the food you're eating and to take extra physical activity or lose any weight that may be appropriate. But type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition and most people will need some form of medication to treat it. These are some of our video links that we have shown you the videos of. 
If you feel like watching it at your time, pace and leisure, please visit YouTube and watch these videos. Thank you for being with us through this module. We hope you choose your drugs well and stay fit and healthy. Thank you.